the top of your lunch. I'm sure very, very happy to be here. And then also, I would like to thank uh, our esteemed uh, LGBT, Dr. Sandhya IPS, for inviting me to this first national workshop on forensic sciences, and Dr. Jay for facilitating my visit today <coughs> to the police academy. So this is my second visit to this campus. In November, I was here for another Uh, so I will be uh, uh, trying to introduce my uh, institute first. I understand that there are participants or delegates from other states of uh, India. <coughs> so uh, we are all in the state of Kerala now. I am coming from the state Kottayam, which is known as the land of three alphabets, the land of latex, letters and lakes. The university is located in a very small town called Adirampura, which is also mentioned in the travelogue of Ibn Battuta, which indicates that the small town has got trade with the external world long back. So the university is named after the father of the nation. We just completed 150th, 150th year of the birth of Mahatma. The university has envisaged lots of new programs with respect to that. The university was established in 1983. Currently, it has got a NAC accreditation uh, with A grade. We have one main campus and uh, eight satellite campuses. Almost 200,000 students enroll every year for different programs. And we were also in the limelight through the Obama Singh Research Initiative. And we were the first state university to be part of such a prestigious program in its first instance. And we have also uh, received the Chancellor's Award for the best outstanding university in the state in the year 2016 and 2018, 2018. And now we are contesting for the award for the year 2019. We are top in the, the South India as per the DST uh, per scheme. As per the NIRF ranking, we have the, as per the uh, Times of India ranking, we are among all the state universities, we are uh, having position 11. The International Center was established in 2009. We have extensive exchange and collaborative programs with the different institutions. We work on thrust, certain thrust areas like nanomaterials, nanochemistry, nanobiology and nanomedicine, green energy, water, climate, social, ethical, and legal, and environmental issues, popularly known as CELE issues. We are trying to formulate policy matters pertaining to nanoscience and nanotechnology research. As I said, we have extensive exchange programs with the different institutions all over the world, I should say. Our students are being sent to these institutions with full funding from the host, and we have visitors around the year uh, in our labs. So we offer courses like MTech in nanoscience and nanotechnology, which will be starting this year onwards. We were offering MS in nanoscience and nanotechnology. And we have PhD in nanoscience and nanotechnology. And we also offer masters in science and physics and MPhil programs in physics with the School of Pure and Applied Physics. We will be launching new programs this year. And the Chief Minister of Kerala had visited Japan. And with Osaka University, we are planning to start a new program on dual degree program in nanoscience and nanotechnology very soon. The center is equipped with a quite large number of sophisticated instruments. And all these instruments could be very well utilized for forensic analysis. So I will be talking a little bit about how these techniques could be employed for uh, analyzing forensic samples. And these facilities are open to all researchers from all over the world. So you can browse our site, you can make a request, you can get a slot for uh, the analysis, and then you can come down if you want. Other, otherwise, our uh, uh, technical staff will do the analysis and send you the results. We have innovative programs like erudite lectures, through which we can invite eminent personalities from different parts of the world to the campus. And they will interact with the students and faculty members and establish collaborative research programs. Professor Rao is a well-wisher of our uh, center. We closely associate with him. And uh, this is the, one of the important programs initiated by the Higher Education Council of uh, uh, State Government of Kerala, through which we are inviting all the eminent personalities. So far, eight Nobel laureates had visited, including the professor late Harold Proto, because 
I will tell you why I am specifically mentioning his name. And the last one was Professor Ada Hionat from Israel. She was the Nobel laureate in chemistry in 2009. And the center has uh, two chair professorships. One is uh, professor, chair professor on uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology. Another one is chair professorship on uh, hybrid materials. So we invite eminent uh, speakers or eminent researchers uh, and honor them with these chair professorships. So these are some of the countries with which we have extensive uh, collaborative programs. Almost all countries in the world we interact. And we run lots of uh, collaborative research programs. So these are some of the logos of our interacting institutions. And uh, we also have industrial corporations like uh, DuPont, uh, Apollo Tires, General Cable, uh, Suffer Street Check, uh, Reliance Industries, MR of so on and so forth. Okay. So this is the typical roadmap for the high AUCNN. We uh, uh, expect to have our nano products in the, uh, in the market by the year 2027. And coming to my specific laboratory, which is named as Advanced Materials Laboratory, I work on issues related to energy security in terms of uh, developing novel materials for solar cells, basically uh, two-dimensional materials and its uh, hybrid uh, structures, light emitting diodes, specifically white limit, light emitting diodes, energy generation and gen energy storage devices, uh, something like fuel cells and batteries, and you know the reason to in chemistry was given to the development of lithium ion batteries. We work extensively in such areas. And EMI shield is, as uh, uh, you know, all of you might be using more than one cell phone probably. And if there is uh, uh, the interference of the signals, the quality of communication will be reduced. So we are developing certain uh, polymer nanocomposites which can replace the metallic EMI shielders, which is being currently used in the mobile phones. If you open your mobile phone, you will find a metallic plant that is the EMI shielder. So we develop polymer nanocomposites for EMI shielding applications. We have three, four uh, patents uh, with respect to this. And in the field of water security, we basically work on uh, materials, particularly complex metal oxides for photocatalysis or electrochemical degradation uh, processes. Uh, and we work on sensors for the detection of pathogens, antibiotics in water bodies. We also work on polymer nanocomposites for water purifications, such as dye adsorption and nanofiltration. And in the field of food security, we work on polymer packaging materials with the controlled permeability of the moisture and oxygen. We also work on edible coating materials for vegetable seeds and fruits. So this is an ongoing program with uh, two universities in the U.S., Kansas State University and North Carolina State University. And our recent Spark project, that is the scheme for the promotion of academic research and collaborations established by the Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India, we got four projects sanctioned altogether to the Nano Center in the last year. And uh, altogether, seven projects got sanctioned to Mahatma Gandhi University. And none of the universities in Kerala were able to achieve this credit. And in the field of health security, we work on medical scaffolds, which can act as a tissue engineering scaffold. Also, it can act as a wound healing uh, material or artificial skin, sustained drug release, and then nano dentistry. We work on magnetic nanomaterials, which can be employed for hypothermia, that is, for cancer treatment and for cell imaging as well. We extensively work in collaboration with the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology to address the global warming issues. I am part of one of the prestigious national program known as CAPEX, in which I am basically analyzing the black carbon content in the aerosols collected from the upper atmosphere, which can be easily related to global warming issues. So these are some of my areas of interest, and the last two one I have added as the nano forensic sciences. I am thankful to uh, our esteemed NDGP, uh, Dr. Santhia who initiated some cooperation with Mahatma Gandhi University in terms of academic programs. We are starting some new programs as ample programs in forensic psychology, forensic science. But I'm mostly interested in establishing a new laboratory, which we uh, 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 named as uh, forensic laboratory or nano forensic laboratory. So we'll be mainly making use of nanoscience and nanotechnology for the analysis of forensic samples, along with uh, laser-induced or laser-based uh, forensic analysis. 
So, let us congratulate all these Nobel Prize winners of 2019. So, most of you may not be aware of nanoscience and nanotechnology. In simple words, I can say that it is basically the science of manipulating atoms and molecules in the nanometer range so as to create novel materials which could be easily designed in the form of certain devices for certain applications. The transformation of science to technology is very, very important. So, we have another term what we call as the nanotechnology. It is nothing but again involves the study of the materials at the uh, uh, level of nanometer which is unimaginably very, very small. So, this is a broad definition you can find lots of definitions in the <coughs> literature which can be correlated with nanoscience and nanotechnology. In simple words, nanoscience and nanotechnology as it indicates is the world of very small things or materials. Nano is a Greek word means dwarf in English. So, I am talking about something which is very, 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 very small which you cannot even think of uh, in the ordinary sense. So, let us try to uh, arrange certain things from large to small large to small, so that you will have some idea about the size regime uh, with which we are trying to manipulate atoms and molecules at the nanoscale. So, if you consider an elephant, say it, is, it's, uh, it, it has a dimension of say 5 meter, a human could be 1 meter, head of a pin could be 2 millimeter, grain of a sand 1 millimeter, dust mite probably 200 micrometer, human hair 100 micrometer red blood cells 10 micrometer, viruses, we talk about lots of viruses, say 100 nanometer, diameter of a DNA 2 nanometer and atom probably could be 0 0.1 nanometer. So, probably you were able to conceive the uh, length scale what we are talking about. So, a material is said to be a nanomaterial if at least it is one of its dimensions is in the nanometer range, say 1 to 100 nanometer. That is the basic definition. But does not mean that suppose you may ask what happens if it is 105, well you can call it as a nanostructured materials. But the thing is that what is the size regime you really want to have. So, according to the application you should be able to tune the size of these materials, so that you can call it as a truly nanostructured material. So, based on the specific application envisaged for, you need to design the molecules and atoms in such a way that we will all them as a nanostructured material. Okay. I will try to show you another length scale here in which I will show one football. Most of you might be playing football, interested in football game. So, which has got these black patches and so the ordinary soccer ball which black and white patches. So, it has got hexagons and pentagons. So, if you try to fix one carbon atom each at each of the corners of that structure, you will end up with a similar kind of cage structure what we call as Buckminster fullerene, popularly known as fullerene molecule or buckyballs, which is a carbon caged carbon structure. So, carbon materials are extensively used in nanoscience and nanotechnology. So, similar structure, if you look at the dimension a football might be having approximately 20, 22 centimeter diameter, the cage structure what I have shown on the uh, right hand side uh, is probably uh, having a dimension 0 0.7 nanometer. So, exactly similar cage structure with the carbon atoms. And one of the inventors, Professor Late Proto, was also in MG University. That is why I specifically mentioned about Professor Proto. So, if you ask me what is nanoscience and nanotechnology, it is actually an interdisciplinary in which all disciplines what we know will converge. Okay. So, I will explain why it is so important because by it, uh, it has a component of uh, medicine, biology, chemistry, material science, physics, computer science because we do lots of simulations in order to design this type of molecule. So, lots of nanomaterials you can actually think of right from nanoparticles like gold nanoparticles, so any, any novel metal nanoparticles, metal oxides, complex metal oxides and then you can have hybrid structures, you can have the uh, incorporation of uh, uh, nanoparticles or metal nanoparticles onto a two dimensional structure like a graphene 
you might be aware of the Nobel Prize in 2010, which was awarded to the discovery of uh, a graphene structure. So, this uh, type of uh, carbon structures are very, very important and magnetic nanoparticles, of course, my group is actively involved in the design and development of novel magnetic uh, nanoparticles and recently we are trying to make hybrid materials with the 2D materials, uh, I mean uh, decorated with the metal nanoparticles, metal oxides and magnetic nanostructures. And coming to nano 4 and 6, which is a new field emerging in which nanotechnology or nanoscience have been widely uh, employed, which can be used for latent fingerprint, developing biosensors, security features in documents such as uh, uh, all the uh, kind of documents we uh, we uh, uh, we write, or even in the uh, uh, in, in identifying fake notes, and also in uh, DNA fingerprint and gunshot residue analysis. So all those things are very very important. So I will touch upon some of our activities with respect to not exactly with the forensic sciences, because this we have now started very recently with the, the Kerala State Police in order to analyze some of the uh, samples which uh, need to be analyzed uh, within a short time period. But we were doing some parallel type of works so that we can easily analyze the forensic sample for the benefit of the society. So what are we are going to do in MG University and what we have done so far with some of the samples I shall highlight uh, in my, uh, through my uh, slides very soon. So nanotechnology in forensic science if you look at which has been emerged as a very important uh, field in the uh, in forensic analysis. So as Professor, I mean, as Mr. Uh, Behra has rightly pointed out, it should be renamed as forensic science and technology. So there should be a transformation of science to technology, so that we can integrate both science and technology together with certain disciplines. So this, again, it has been pointed out by the uh, uh, the dignified police personnel here that uh, compared to the western world, the forensic approach particularly uh, for uh, uh, identifying the criminals or solving a particular uh, uh, criminal issue uh, is not to that level reached in India. So we need to think the analysis in a very different way so that we could be at par with the western world. In, uh, in, uh, in the forensic analysis as well. So there are different areas which you can uh, actually identify for forensic investigation like fingerprint identification, estimation of time since death, explosive residue detection, screening of drug facilitated crime which is very common nowadays in India, DNA analysis, nano trackers like microfluidic systems which can be taken to the crime site and analysis can be done then and then ion beam analysis, GSR analysis I have mentioned and for security applications. So various techniques could be employed. So why I am pointing out this thing is that as a material physicist or a nano material physicist, we have lots of sophisticated equipment which can be easily utilized for analyzing all the different samples which is uh, you know put under the forensic uh, materials or forensic uh, crime. Uh, samples which have been collected from different crime sites. Say for example, X-ray diffraction which is a very, very popular technique and then Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy rightly our esteemed governor had pointed out that FTIR, Raman spectroscopy, all this spectroscopic techniques he has mentioned in the morning and these are complementary techniques which could be used for identification of forensic samples. UV Raman spectroscopy I have mentioned, UV visible near infrared spectroscopy photoluminescent spectroscopy, electron microscopy, you have a transmission electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, field emission uh, scanning electron microscopy and then scanning probe microscopic techniques such as atomic force microscopy, laser based techniques such as laser induced breakdown spectroscopy and hyperspectral imaging. And the, uh, the honorable governor had also mentioned in the morning that along with uh, uh, our uh, esteemed DGP that we can also have laser induced ablation uh, uh, with uh, inductive coupled plasma with mass spectrometry. So these are the highly sophisticated techniques which can be employed for trace analysis. So all those things we, we can have at MG University as well. So these are some of the 
high transmission electron microscopic images as well as the uh, high resolution transmission electron microscopic images. So, these are the silver nanospheres. We create different types of materials like with the different morphologies, spheres, cubes, stars and then wires extensively and then we decorate them with other type of materials like 2D materials like a molybdenum disulfide or graphene oxide, reduced graphene oxide so on and so forth. And you can also see the kind of uh, lines, can you see that? I have marked, uh, in, in my, it is not that visible, but in the second graph I have uh, mentioned some width as and it is mentioned as 0 0.204 nanometer. So, that is the distance between two lattices. So, a lattice is something uh, like you have an infinite arrangement of atoms, infinite arrangement of atoms. So, for example, if you look at the seat, you can consider this as one lattice in which atoms are sitting and the next row another set of atoms are sitting and the distance between these two lattices is mentioned there as 0 0.24 nanometer. You can just imagine how small it is, which could be easily seen by making use of high resolution transmission electron microscope, which we have installed through the DST nanomission uh, project, thanks to Professor Siena Rao for his uh, unconditional support to the center. And this is the field emission scanning electron microscopic images of some of the hybrid structures what we have created in the lab. So, you can see the uh, uh, graphene, which is a uh, atomic layer of uh, carbon atoms. You have the honeycomb structure in which these atoms have been arranged. So, you can see the number of layers you can estimate. And then we have decorated the cubes, wires, and then spheres with the uh, graphene layers. So, we synthesize or we design lots of novel materials, hybrid materials for diversified applications. So, this is again a term image of the nitrogen sulfur co doped graphene structure. You replace the carbon atoms with the sulfur and nitrogen, and the properties could be tuned. So, this is again the uh, HRTM images of the uh, decorated uh, graphene layers with the uh, silver nanospheres and cubes and then wires. So, air from as I said it is a uh, scanning probe microscopic technique which can be extensively used for forensic analysis particularly to understand the surface morphology. So, it basically has a laser source and then which interacts with the with the uh, so it has got a it has got a tip usually it is a uh, very uh, tough uh, diamond tip which is mounted on a cantilever and this cantilever moves. So, your surface if it is rough, there are three different modes through which you can operate an AFM. So, one is the tapping mode, it will touch the surface, another one is the contact mode, it will just uh, scan over the surface, another one is non-contact mode. So, these three modes can be easily utilized and because this, because of the surface morphology variations, the laser which is hitting on the surface will be deflected and that deflection is easily being detected using a photodiode. So, this is a very compact and sophisticated instrument which can be coupled with other techniques like uh, micro Raman spectroscopy. So, you have we have air from coupled with a micro Raman. So, you can look at a one particular surface, you get the Raman signals from that. So, you can have elemental analysis by making use of this coupled type of instrumentation. So, air from in forensic sciences uh, have been uh, proposed uh, for the determination of explosive like firearm incident examination, fire investigation, explosives detection, shooting distance determination, biological analysis like a blood analysis, the diatom test, human hair analysis and computer an computational analysis such as how to recover data from a damaged SIM card unit. So, uh, in the morning uh, Behra was again mentioning about the cyber crime. So, all those things could be easily uh, addressed using this kind of uh, extensive sophisticated techniques. And again in the document analysis like a line crossing examination or if there is a forged signature if you want to identify that by simply looking at the impressions of the uh, of, of the letters you can easily identify whether a particular document is correct or not. And surface analysis as I said you can get a good information regarding the surface information. So, for I will, I will show you some of the uh, examples like if some ink is fallen on a paper and then if you want to recover certain data, incidentally a couple of weeks back we have received a, uh, a call, I, I have received a call from the SP, uh, Mr. Vinod, they wanted to identify certain things like some document which was presented by a villager or somebody, 
which was completely blackened and they wanted to know what is below that. So, it, it means something has written or something is there, but it is not visibly seen with ordinary eye. Then I said you can bring it here, we have some fluorescent microscope. If the coated material is fluorescent, probably you will get some kind of information. Unfortunately, the ink they have used was not fluorescent, but we did have, have the same fluorescent microscope we have used, but in a tilted position we have arranged it and illuminated from the back side and it was a sketch in which it was clearly mentioned about the dimensions. So, they were so happy. So, we can analyze you know different samples for different applications. So, we were also so, so happy that initially we thought that we will not be able to do it, but I said anyway you can send the sample we will give a try. So, you can actually use your common sense also sometimes to get good data from this kind of uh, samples. Okay. So, this is a, a document paper comparison. So, this is a topographic image showing the uh, significant height differences here this part, this marked part and this part is the amplitude image revealing a minimized uh, 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 image on a particular dimension. So, you can actually get information regarding the surface morphology for uh, forensic applications. So, this is a typical graph indicating, so this is a blank uh, graph paper and this is the ink deposited paper surface. You can do a scanning and then you can get the amplitude variations with respect to this. So, all these techniques could be easily used for forensic analysis and then you know the data could be easily quantified and uh, uh, our esteemed uh, uh, governor has also mentioned about the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. So, this is again another tool in which you can actually get the information regarding the molecular vibrations and this is a technique uh, complement to the Raman spectroscopy. Either Raman spectroscopic technique you can employ or you can use the FTIR spectroscopy. So, but the only problem is that the samples need to be collected and transported properly particularly for forensic analysis. So, we have made some suggestions to the police people how to collect the sample so that it can be analyzed in a proper way because we need to have the sufficient quantity of the samples so that we can do the analysis in a perfect way. So, this is a FTR uh, uh, data uh, of a biocomponent fiber. So, this is actually the UV visible absorption spectrum we have taken. This is absorbance as a function of uh, I mean this is an FTR data in which you can have the wave number plotted as a function of absorbance. So, each of these peaks corresponds to certain molecular vibrations. In fingerprint analysis, uh, the, uh, the same technique could be easily employed. There are different modifications of the approaches which can be used for fingerprint analysis. So, this is a typical proposal in which both infrared and Raman spectroscopy could be easily employed along with mass spectrometry you can actually ablate, laser ablate the particular area and then ablated species could be taken through a mass spectrometer for the quantification of the molecules present. In some cases, you can have the fluorescent uh, signals coming out which could be collected using a photodiode and this fluorescent data could also be analyzed. So, there are different ways in which you can address a particular problem and in most of the cases particularly, I will emphasize this particular point that in forensic analysis, you need to use at least two techniques minimum to cross check whether your results are correct or not. If you are ending up with a wrong analysis, a innocent individual could be conv uh, convicted or a culprit could be escaped because of the wrong analysis. So, this is again uh, another type of uh, detection mechanism in which electrochemical luminescence has been employed. You take the luminescent data from the surfaces you have uh, a, a, a incident beam and this you have a certain molecule which could be introduced on the surface and then you can light or illuminate the surface with a particular and then you can look into the luminescent spectrum. I okay. will skip this and again in the case of explosive detection. So, uh, I had mentioned the same thing in my last lecture because I was traveling to Europe. I have lots of uh, uh, visiting professorships with many of the universities in Europe. So, I have been traveling, quite traveling through uh, Dubai in fact. So, there you can find that you will be asked to remove your shoes, everything, belt, everything and then they will do a, a sort of a sticker, they will put a sticker on the 
uh, on the bags and other things in order to check whether some explosives or a, a terrorist uh, activating materials are carrying or not. So, they have a very sensitive kind of detector system through which you can easily say that whether they are carrying some kind of uh, you know a classified drugs or explosives. So, I was just thinking about that, but at the same time we were doing certain kind of paper based sensors for the detection of pathogens and analytes in or adulterate uh, components in food materials. So, I was thinking that okay, the same kind of approach could be easily adopted for the detection of explosives or certain kind of drugs if it is needed. So, I will come to that within a short time period. Uh, so, you can use all those things. So, this is a, a typical technique in which they have used the curcumin nanoparticle. Are you familiar with curcumin? Curcuma that is the uh, uh, manual, what we, what we normally call as manual. So, its nanoparticles can be easily functionalized and this is the one which they have done with a, an explosive like TNT. They functionalized this curcumin nanoparticles and they have made a, 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 a kind of a hybrid materials and this will show some changes in the, in the structure and particularly in the absorption spectrum, it will change some variations. So, we can easily detect this kind of explosive even if it is uh, at a very minute uh, level. Another important aspect with, with respect to forensic science is time since death de determination. So, this is based on the fact that you can have the vitreous humor which remains unchanged over a period of time. So, you can collect the blood samples and then you can analyze this. So, that you can uh, up to say 96 hours it is estimated that this uh, the vitreous humor will be staying uh, you know stable. So, that you can analyze the degradation of this particular material. So, that you can predict the uh, time since uh, death. And this is one of the techniques uh, we are also planning to start immediately like the microfluidic system. You can take it to the, uh, uh, to the crime site and you can easily take a blood sample from the body. You can put it in the microfluidic system and which can easily predict the time since death. So, this is the dot plot analysis that people have done and reported in 2014. So, screening of drug facilitated crime is again another important aspect for uh, uh, our social security. So, in that context uh, people have used silver, I mean gold nanoparticles. So, gold nanoparticles as per their dimensions they will have a different uh, optical properties. Their absorption properties will be different, their uh, emission properties will be different. So, absorption properties what I mean is that how much energy they can absorb and their vibrational frequencies will be different. So, you can easily identify or you can tune the uh, kind of sensors with respect to the uh, dimensions of the uh, nanoparticles. So, this is another technique people have uh, 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 developed in 2018 there is a report that silver nanoparticles with a suitable dimension which can be uh, uh, functionalized with the uh, nitrogen containing ligand molecule. So, this is a functionalized molecule and if there is a drug that will interact with the drug and the colorimeter changes you can easily detect. So, these are the techniques already available which you can tune with the different types of nanoparticles. So, absorption spectrum is an important anal analytical tool UV visible absorption spectrometer you can employ and the absorption uh, dimensions or the variations in the absorption process can be easily detected by making use of this type of hybrid structures. So, this is one area there is a surface enhanced Raman skating technique. This is the one we are mostly into for uh, detecting very minute quantities of certain pollutants or uh, certain kind of adulterates in the uh, in the food uh, in the food systems. So, this is a very very sensitive technique because Raman signals are very 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 weak. So, you need to enhance the uh, uh, Raman signals by incorporating certain type of nanoparticles which will act as hot spots and then they will enhance the Raman signals. So, there are two different uh, types of enhancement technique. One is the electromagnetic enhancement technique, another one is the chemical chemically induced enhancement. That is the chemical enhancement or the electromagnetic field enhancement. So, it is very it is very sensitive, it has got very specificities to certain molecules and a valuable tool for analyzing mixtures, mixtures because the vibrational modes will be different for different molecules. Say for example, carbon carbon bone will be vibrating with certain frequencies, carbon oxygen molecules will be vibrating with the different frequencies, carbon hydrogen bones vibrations will be different. So, accordingly you can analyze these uh, signals and based on the surface enhanced Raman signals you can actually create a platform 
for the detection of di different analytes. I will show you some of the things what we have done. This is the detection of uh, rhodamine 6G, which is a dye molecule, which we have done using silver decorated nitrogen sulfur co-doped graphene structure. So, you can see that this uh, analysis is very perfect in the detection of carbon hydrogen plane bond bending, carbon oxygen carbon stretching bonds, carbon carbon stretching of the aromatic ring. So, you can have the uh, different type of uh, uh, Raman signals and accordingly you can analyze the system. So, this work was uh, recently published in carbon in 2018, particularly for cis applications. And this is another work we have published in Langmuir, uh, 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 in which we have done the synthesis, that is the in situ synthesis of silver nanospheres, cubes and wires over boron doped uh, graphene sheets for surface enhanced uh, Raman detection of uh, hydrogen peroxide. This is an enzyme free detection of hydrogen peroxide. So, likewise you can uh, an, uh, detect a different enzyme. So, this is again another work we have done like by making use of graphene nano buds, in which you have actually tried to identify the we made it as a phosgene uh, first sensor with ultra low detection limit in aqueous solution. So, particularly in water bodies one of the emerging pollutants are I mean is the antibiotics. So, the antibiotics are reaching the water bodies due to several reasons unethical disposal of the drugs antibiotics and the uh, extensive usage of an antibiotics for animals and uh, through their excretory systems uh, this will be reaching the water bodies and unknowingly the aquatic animals and aquatic uh, creatures they will consume this and from them it reaches to humankind. So, there are different ways of uh, uh, getting all these kind of you know unwanted stuffs to our uh, body which are very much alarming. So, ultra uh, sensitive detection of these kind of pollutants are very very important. So, a few forensic studies we have performed at, uh, our, at MG University, I will show you that. So, these are the Raman studies we have uh, done on samples collected, I think it is a, a suicidal case in which they have collected samples from the neck, uh, legs and hands and then we have analyzed some of these uh, 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 samples uh, which is given as a row, a row sample and then we are trying to now identify the variations in the uh, Raman signal. So, these are the Raman spectra corresponding to neck and foot which are showing different uh, type of signals. And this is again the AFM images we have performed from the left foot, neck, uh, right foot, right hand and then left hand. So, the analysis is going on and in the case of the, the one of the uh, problems posed to us was uh, they were not able to identify whether it is a homicide or a suicidal case. So, we wanted to identify the different types of materials which are being used for these purposes, whether it is for a suicidal attempt or for a or a or a or a homicidal action. So, we have tried to analyze some of the available type of uh, fibers. So, this is a typical plastic loop which is showing an FTR uh, structure, these peaks and then the plastic uh, tie, the normal one and then we try to uh, understand if it is you know, say white twine is being used what happens. So, we try to understand the, uh, the different uh, uh, peaks corresponding to the FTR spectrum and the black twine so on and so forth. So, this is a jute fiber. So, all these type of materials will have different molecules involved and accordingly their vibrational modes will be different. So, we are trying to make a data bank associated with the different types of uh, materials which are available in the market. So, then it easily you can correlate this data with one of the samples when you receive it then and there. So, this is a cotton fiber this is the again the FTR spectrum corresponding to wire fiber. So, for a better comparison I have put everything together. So, you will find some variations in the corresponding peaks which need to be analyzed very carefully before you come to a conclusion. So, these are the some of the forensic samples we have analyzed we collected from different parts of the body and then we are trying to correlate whether the same uh, samples are being seen at different parts of the same body. So, this is again an important uh, uh, technique laser induced breakdown spectroscopy. We are into laser plasma, plasma is the fourth state of matter. So, you have the uh, uh, solid state, liquid state and the vapor state and then the fourth state is the ionized state. So, we make use of the laser sources to make a plasma and then we are trying to understand the plasma parameters like the uh, electron uh, density, the neutral density and the uh, temperature of the plasma. 
and you will be surprised to note that even with a small uh, plasma plume, the temperature could be that is uh, uh, prevailing in the uh, in the sun. So, so much of temperature can be created. So, that is one of the techniques today uh, uh, Mr. Behra was referring to the laser ablated inductive coupled plasma with mass spectrometry. So, we are uh, having a facility uh, 1 joule NDI laser which can be which we are using mainly to ablate a, a metal surface in a liquid medium and then trying to understand the plasma propagation and the dynamics. So, we have the ICCD camera, CCD camera spectrograph with which you can even detect very minute vibrations of the molecules and you can identify the plasma parameters. So, laser has become a very important tool in different technological uh, analytical instruments. So, one of the important aspect is that it is monochromatic in nature that is the wavelength is the same and it is highly focused and uh, the it can interact with the matter. So, if you ask me what is laser induced break, break, breakdown spectroscopy, as it is mentioned spectroscopy in the light is interacting with the matter and then it generates the plasma and this plasma parameters could be easily used for the analysis. So, you have a laser source, you have a laser source which interacts with the matter and it is uh, uh, in the plasma state that is in the ionized state and the emitted signals could be taken or analyzed through a spectrometer and corresponding to the different materials what you have, they will have the spectral signatures which can be identified. So, advantages are like it is a real time response, it is quick, capable of real time detection of all classes of chemical compounds. You can simply ablate, you can get the corresponding uh, you know elemental analysis using the spectroscopic data. You also have a fiber optic spectrometer which you can easily put into the plume and then you can get the signals. We have a spectrograph 50, 50 centimeter spectrograph, so it can collect the vibrational signals over a length scale which can be uh, analyzed easily and again it is connected to an ICCD camera. So, the collection of the signals analyzed through the ICCD camera. So, the identification of materials could be performed, material characterization can be performed, origin determination what are the type of materials we can have. We can also have nanoparticle production and in the case of forensic uh, analysis you ablate the samples and then you can get the uh, different kind of uh, elements present in the system. So, you will find that uh, in forensic science you can have the analysis in different ways right from the counterfeit currency analysis, explosive fingerprint, hair analysis, pain, gunshot residue, uh, whatever it is. So, in different ways you can employ this kind of techniques. <coughs> At MG University as I said we have a 1 joule NDI laser, very high power laser and its harmonics are available 532 to 1024 nanometer wavelengths are available and these interactions with these uh, materials are different with the different frequencies. We are also going to have the femtosecond laser so that the interactions of the femtosecond laser and the nanosecond laser that is in the different frequency regimes will be different. So, it can be uh, analyzed. So, we have the vacuum chamber, we have an adequate uh, uh, system for the beam delivery and data collection and proper sample accuracy. So, this technique is going to be one of the important tool for forensic analysis which we have done a little bit, but we need to optimize the parameters now. So, this is one of our recent papers in which we have used the laser ablation of the gold nanoparticles and decoration of the same on the graphene surface for chemical analysis and catalysis. So, what we have done is that we have the graphene oxide which we have prepared and then we have ablated the gold foil in the uh, graphene um, colloidal solution and then we have uh, uh, decorated the graphene layer with the uh, with the cool nanoparticle. So, the emission spectra will be different if you have a different type of clusters. So, the number of atoms what you have together will have a different property. Say for example, a 3 atom gold cluster will have a different behavior than that of a 5 or 6 atoms uh, uh, cluster uh, gold nanoparticles. So, these are the typical HRTM data which you can see that uh, you know the different sizes of the nanoparticles could be created. You can see the transparent layer this is almost a single atom uh, graphene layer. So, we have the technique to produce single atom uh, graphene layers. So, this is our experimental setup we have the NDI laser this is the spectrometer and this is the target holder. So, the spectrometer will collect all the emission signals and which can be easily collected through an ICCD camera which is attached on the other side of the 
spectrometer. So we have done some preliminary experiments with respect to this. And so for example, we have ablated the aluminum and chromium and the spectral data is standard data is available and we have compared with that. Now we will extend this to the forensic samples available. So if you have a data bank, it is easy for us to correlate that with the, the data bank. If not, we need to create data banks. So for example, particularly for the drugs, different drugs, it might not be available. So we have to first have a data bank and then we can have to correlate once the samples have been brought to the laboratory. So we will have the experimental setup ready very soon with the femtosecond laser and then we need to repeat the experiments at least thrice in order to quantify the final result. So this is a very challenging experiment. So I am going to show another important aspect that is the hyperspectral imaging. So Professor Murugation is a senior professor and director of the uh, laser laboratory there uh, uh, in Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. I am having another Spark project with him. So currently he is in India, but unfortunately he could not join us because uh, he had to deliver a talk in the uh, Indian, National, uh, Science Congress, Indian Science Congress uh, going on in Bangalore. So I will be showing some of his results. He has used this hyperspectral imaging for uh, understanding uh, different, different types of uh, samples by making use of a laser spectrum. So this has been used uh, as an uh, anal uh, analytical tool, uh, as a spectral library for many of the polymer samples, particularly the bank nodes. So they are permitted to use only the $10 uh, uh, US dollar currency and they have used uh, for the analysis. So people are now transforming to polymer based currencies and then the fake nodes are, uh, I mean th there is every chance that fake nodes could be created in the, in the market. So this is a typical setup what they have used for the hyperspectral imaging that they have the light source usually it is a usually it is a laser and the sample is being kept here so the laser interact with the sample and the data has been collected through a spectrograph what I have shown before and then it is detected using a camera we have the uh, uh, ICCD camera and the analysis could be performed so this has been widely being used in counterfeit uh, detection as I said for the and ten dollar notes, the fake and the normal one, they have used at its three seventy five nanometer illumination. They have used a continuous wave laser and they have chopped the signal. But we have a uh, <coughs> pulsed laser source, which can be the frequency could be tuned very easily. So the finger marks are one of the most valuable types of physical evidences you can have, and its detection plays a significant role in forensic analysis. So the existing detection techniques for latent finger marks have its own limitations. So people have proposed the different types of uh, kind of things. So in this context, the, the fluorescent uh, light induced uh, technique is considered to be one of the powerful techniques for the detection. So this is again another schematic of uh, the laser based uh, type of detection system. Here as I said, they have used an argon laser which is a continuous one and then they have chopped it in order to create a particular pulse of duration. And in our laboratory, we have a one joule India laser, very powerful one, which is a pulsed laser, and this pulse duration could be varied so that the exact setup we could set up in the in the laboratory for this kind of analysis. So this is again his paper, phase resolved fluorescence technique with the heterodyne signal processing, which is again very very important, highly complicated because the signals are very 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 small most of the time, and the analysis will become very very complex. So this is again another schematic in which they have used uh, the, uh, the fluorescent excitation wavelength for the analysis. So with this, uh, I will try to conclude that uh, different uh, uh, sophisticated techniques could be employed for forensic analysis, particularly nanoscience and nanotechnology could be employed for the development of sensors. And the techniques what we normally employ for nano, uh, nanomaterial analysis can be easily brought to forensic analysis. And again, I emphasize that at least you need to have two techniques to, uh, uh, to quantify the results to make sure that the analysis is perfect and there is no uh, uh, pitfalls in the analysis because these are all very sensitive samples. Even when I am planning to set up the forensic lab at MG University, I have requested the university to provide a specific place to keep the samples and keep the data as well. So it has to, uh, it has to be handled with utmost care 
So, that the analysis should be very, very perfect. With this, I conclude. If you have any questions, I shall try to answer. And thank you very much. I request respected Srimadhi Anamma John Madam, former Assistant Director, RFSL, to present a memento as a token of our gratitude to Sri Nandagumar Kalajikil.